Okay, let's turn to Exodus 35. And I better not lollygag with pleasantries and all of that. I want to make sure I move quickly enough and leave time uh, for David with the Lord's Supper. But truly on task and being on task, all of us who have managed children or employees or even in our own behavior, we have seen what on task is and what not on task is. And, and just because we are about the work doesn't mean that we were actually doing the work. Y'all know very well, you know, if you're like me and it's, you know, tax time, I can sit there with all of my bank records and receipts and everything in front of me and, and an hour can go by and I really didn't get much done because it's not what I want to do. And, and I remember other times, well, I tell you what, if it's time to load up and go fishing, I, I'm on task. You know, I pop up that morning at 4 a.m. with energy. <laughs> I woke up this morning. I, I must have slept so soundly last night. I, I, was, I woke up about 4 o'clock and I thought, you know, I'm going to go back to sleep for a little bit. I'm still really groggy. And I, and I sat there for a few minutes. I was like, can you go back to sleep? Is there any reason why? And I was like, no, there's no reason why I can't go back to sleep. And I, and I sat back down. I was like, it's Sunday. I was like, no, I can't go back to sleep, you know. And then I realized I had to, I had to get up and go in there and study and pray. I, I saw the, the great potential of dynamic in my own life at a young age about being on task. I, well, I grew up on a ranch, out in the middle of nowhere. We were all competent at an early age, driving around, you know, by myself at 10, 11 years old on the ranch and trucks and doing those sort of things and camping out by myself on the ranch sometimes, you know, at a young 10, 11, 12 years old. And, and it was kind of normal. You know, I know it's not normal for most of, you know, of the United States, but it was normal. And my parents, uh, I recall a number of times, would go to, like, hunting exhibitions since we were a game ranch. And, and they'd be gone for, you know, three or four days. We could drive ourselves up to the bus stop, you know, catch the bus and go to school and come back. And, and uh, I remember more than anything, just one sister and I having that experience a few times of staying home alone. And there were other adults on the ranch, you know, there was ranch hands and whatnot, so I don't I don't want y'all to th start calling CPS and, 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 you know, maybe they can go back and prosecute from 20-something years ago. But, but, you know, we would leave and my parents wouldn't have to emphasize how they wanted the house to be kept and what kind of condition they wanted the house to be in when they returned. I tell you what, as soon as they left, though, boy, we were off task. We had all kinds of things, you know, like ice down three liters of Coke with aquarium tube running across the living room, right? So we could just sit there and, yeah, you know, y'all remember that goofy stuff you did, right? And go on some kind of, you know, 10-hour video game movie binge or something like that. And, you know, this is before cell phones, before internet, before, you know, Life 360 on your phone. So you could say, where are my parents, you know? You know? All we had, we had a, you know, five-mile entrance to the ranch you know, on a private gravel road. And, you know, at the entrance of the ranch, there was a gate, and it was green. And guess what we called it? The green gate. And there was the green gate, and there was a phone that you just picked up that just automatically dialed landline to the ranch house, right? And, you know, and when hunters would come, they'd pick up the phone, and I'm at the gate. Okay, well, we'd go meet them, or we'd give them the combo or whatever it is. And my parents, I, you know, I guess looking back, they had a gracious element to them because they didn't have to. But for some reason, on their way back, when they would get to that gate, they would pick up the phone and call us. And they'd tell us, we're at the green gate. Oh, <laughs> oh now that, when you talk about truly on task, I was amazed how much I could get done in just 20 minutes. You know, that, I knew we had like 20 minutes time, you know, before the judgment arrived. 
you know, and it was something near to the second coming of Christ. You know, if you go over there, Revelation 18, 19, 20, I mean, I imagine that that's, you know, my mom's return and her house disastrous. So we, with fear, like we popped into gear, right? And we, boy, we were on task and we got so much done in that 20 minutes, you know, and they got as if it was like that the whole time, right? No, but uh, that, you know, I learned at a very young age, I was like, boy, you know, I can procrastinate, procrastinate, procrastinate. But boy, when there's motivation to be on task, how much we can be on task. And I just saw that this week, looking, reading here in 35 and and the action that they were now to take, and you know, and this is action after you know some some flip floppy experiences. God had sent Moses up on the mountain the first time, and forty days was too long, and they rebelled. They built a golden calf, and uh, and God chastised them for it, and God took them back through it again. Well, guess what? You still have to wait another forty days, you know, and you have to go through the whole thing again. And Moses is going to go up on the mountain again. We're going to do this again until you get it right. And they did it again, and, and Moses got the second copy of the Ten Commandments, and he came back down, and they got back to the point, they got to where God wanted them to be and where they were going. And we pick up here in 35, and it says, Then Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said to them, These are the words which the Lord has commanded you to do. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day shall be a holy day for you, a Sabbath of rest. To the Lord, whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your dwellings on the Sabbath day. And Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, saying, Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring an offering to the Lord. Gold, silver, and bronze. Blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, and goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, badger skins, and acacia wood, oil for the light, and spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. Let's pray. Father, God, we come here this morning, Lord, with a variety of resources unto you, God, some of us giving of our skills and our time. Lord, many of us, God, giving of our finances and our wealth. God, all of us, Lord, offering the sacrifice of praise. But Lord, most of all, God, let us come and even present ourselves before you, Lord, as a vessel for your use, as a tool. Lord, like a glove for you to put your hand in to make use of. Lord, let, let us be like that. And I pray, God, that you would speak this word into us and into our lives and into our hearts, Lord. And Lord, may it not fall on deaf ears and insensitivity, God, and hardness of heart, Lord, but I pray that it would pierce and discern and penetrate God. And we don't want to hear just some fluffy thing and go off about the week, Lord. We, we ask, Lord, for your intervention and your confrontation. And we present ourselves before you as your children, Lord, to receive instruction and correction and your encouragement. God, teach us from your word, I pray, and change us, God, by your word, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. It began by Moses bringing him back around, and I think this is the fourth time that they heard this. Fourth time, I think, recorded in Exodus, if I remember correctly, about the Sabbath day. These are the words which the Lord has commanded you, is what it said in verse 1. And he told them, you know, about the Sabbath and the commands of it. And he goes on to, to carry a lot more of the commandments that were given unto them. But there's something important there about being on task in life is you have to have a familiarization with what the task is. You have to even know what you've been commanded to do. And everybody would say, well, yeah, of course, you know, that's silly, right? Now you, you, in, but it's not silly. Because think right now in your mind, can you recite the Ten Commandments from memory? 
You get stuck somewhere, like on maybe six or seven. Oh, I mean, do you know what the Lord has commanded you to do? Or can you, can you be reminded of it once you hear it? You're like, yeah, that's right, that's right. That's not knowing, that's being reminded. Knowing is being able to produce and to recite. What about if you just started in Matthew and thought through the New Testament? Can you think of ten commandments that are given in the New Testament? You can think of a lot just in like Matthew 5 and 6, Sermon on the Mountain. Right? Sermon on the Mountain, he gives all of those, he gives a lot of in there. You know, when you give alms, right? When you pray, don't do this and make sure you do this. And, you know, right there, there's a bunch all through the epistles. Gobs of commandments, gobs of instruction, a whole bunch of them there. But our trouble is, is that we need to know them. We, do, we need to even have it in our mind. We need to know what has God commanded us to do? What are we even supposed to be doing? I don't know if y'all have ever taught school or a group of kids and you got group projects and you sit up there and you explain it to them for 20 or 30 minutes and you go through the whole thing and you know and and you think you've done a good job explaining it and then they get into their group projects and you go around desk to desk and location and you're like okay well what are y'all doing why I don't know what we're supposed to be doing and you're thinking well you knuckleheads you know like didn't I just just told you but think about how realistic that is in our own lives how, do we, how well do we know? Now, you know, when we think about the Word of God and we think about the Bible and everything that's been given unto us, much of that is compulsory. Much of it is God's commandment. You shall do this. You have to do this. And that's what they were working with. You know, that was one of the compulsory commandments that was given to them, that they had to recognize the Sabbath day, and they had to keep the Sabbath day, <clears throat> something that he required for them to do. But the trouble was, was they were not well familiar with his ways. It tells us in Hebrews, you don't have to turn there. I have it marked. It'll be quick. He said, uh, Hebrews 3.10, he says, Therefore, he says, I was angry with that generation. He's literally talking about the same people there in, in Exodus. He said, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. Why? Next line, he says, and they have not known my way. You're like, well, how could they not know his ways? Well, the same way that you and I can sit under the teaching of the Word of God and have read through it numerous times and then sit down and really struggle to think about Ten Commandments out of the, the Ten Commandments or New Testament Commandments. Like, what, is, what does the Bible instruct us to do? And it takes an intentional effort, doesn't it, to, to learn them and to you know, write them down and to remember them and to know, like, wait, these are the ways of the Lord. And perhaps, yes, it is easier to remember in context and something that will remind you. And, and maybe, you know, your friend in the Lord is, you know, boozing it up a little too much. And you say, and then, oh, you remember, hey, don't be drunk with wine. That's a commandment. <clears throat> Y'all know the next commandment that's given after that in Ephesians? But be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. It's like there's another one right there. You know, now, we would, now we would think getting drunk with wine was a great offense to the Lord because you're not keeping a commandment that's given in the epistle, right? But, but what about the next one? But be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, one is as good as the other. It's, it's rebellion all the same to not be filled with the Spirit as it is to be drunk with wine. But we've got to know. We've got to understand what they are. <clears throat> Over in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1 is another good example. Isaiah 1, verse 10, <clears throat> it says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom, give ear to my law. Uh, uh, give ear to the law of God, you people of Gomorrah. Now, Isaiah was written in a time when, when God's people were very rebellious and very well backslid and in a bad way, <clears throat> and their prosperity had led to a moral degrade. And then we look in verse 11 here of Isaiah 1, it says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and, fat, uh, and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or the, lamb, or the lambs of goats. He said, When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand? To trample my courts, bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure the uh, iniquity of the sacred meeting. He said, your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. 
They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear you. Hear you. Your hands are full of blood. They were doing something. I mean, they were, they were on task, you could say. They had all kinds of religious activities going on. He said right there, he didn't, he didn't say, you're not offering me sacrifices. He said, I can't stand your sacrifices. He didn't say, you're not coming to church. He said, Who's, why are you coming to church? He didn't say, you're not keeping the festivals that I commanded. He said, I can't, I can't stand them. Because something was missing, and we see here that there's, there's more than one thing going on back in chapter 35. You know, there's the reminder of the compulsory. These things you must do, right? And he wanted them to hold on to this and to know his ways and to know his commandments, to know the guidelines that he's given. And it was the word of God that they needed to remember. You'll remember in like in Psalm 119, where will, uh, wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? Thy word, right? By taking heed unto thy word. And he goes on to say, thy word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin. You see, getting the commandment of God, understanding it, knowing it, keeping it, being able to reproduce it, you actually know what you're supposed to be doing. Or rather, in this sense, what you're not supposed to be doing. Right? He gives, he gives commandments, and this, this you shall do, and he gives commandments, this you shall not do. Right? We call them sins of omission and commission. But we need to know, we need to at least understand what the will of God is. And that was one thing that Moses reminded them of and reminded them of. And even in Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law, he sat down and in one day and he reminded them all again. And we have to remind ourselves, I don't know how you do it, but I copy it down. I write it down and I, you know, latch onto things and I have to copy scripture to, to learn it and to memorize it and to know it. But look a little further. And Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, saying, Take from among you an offering to the Lord, whoever is of a willing heart. Let him bring it as an offering to the Lord. And he goes on, gold, silver, and bronze, and blue, purple, and all the, all the materials that were needed, right, for the tabernacle. But there's a change in what they're doing. And if we you pay attention as we read through this chapter, you're going to find it a lot as his heart stirred him, as their heart stirred him or whoever was of a, of a willing heart. It's, it's that word that is all based on nadab. There's nadab, you know, with an emphasis on the A, and then that, that was generous, generosity. And you remember Aaron's eldest son, his, when, once you turn it into a proper noun there, the accent on both Nadab, you know, and Abihu. And y'all remember those guys got a little goofy and liquored up and God was not too happy with what they were doing, you know. But generous, generosity. And all these words are related. The free will offering that, you know, who was um, of a willing heart. But, you know, we get into a place here. It was not compulsory for them to come and to give an offering. It's very clear. Very clear back there a few chapters ago when he first told Moses that they were going to do this. It's very clear here that it was not compulsory that they had to do this, but God was looking for volunteers. And that's rather interesting to me. That there's two aspects to... Taking action with the Lord. There's two aspects here. There's, there's one that's compulsory and there's one that's voluntary. And I think we see that, you know, in examples like Isaiah chapter 1, where he went in there and he went into all of those things like giving offerings and, you know, and God says, I don't like them. Why? Because you go a little further there in Isaiah chapter 1 and you find out what they were not doing. You know, he says, you have blood on your hands. In verse 16, he says, wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. There was the first step. Forsaking the things that God had said to forsake. Obeying him in that sense, in the compulsory things, having that down. 
doing that well. And then when you go on to the issues of fellowship and blessings, like making an offering, then it's something that God would want. It's something that he would receive. I think we can understand this in our own relationships. What if your spouse, you came home and, you know, and your spouse told you, hey, you know, I've been having an extramarital affair for a few weeks, but I made you a nice dinner. Y'all want to eat up? Yeah? Sit down and share that nice dinner. But look at the sacrifice. I mean, I, I did something nice for you. Is it worth anything? No. No. And I'm sure we all have the experience of our children not doing the things which we told them to do, and they go about doing something voluntary that's nigh, but I drew you a picture. Well, you know, I didn't ask you to draw me a picture. I asked you to clean your room. And we're like, you know, we understand, <clears throat> right? How, but we can do that with God. But God, I honored you for my wealth. I came and I gave my tie this morning. He's like, no, this is all the garbage in, the, in, the, in your life the last week that I have a problem with. But I sang praises unto you. He says, well, I don't want your praises until I have your obedience. Do you all remember the account with Saul? If you all don't, you know, there was a king, the first king of Israel named Saul, and he was a great, you know, started out to have a great start, really blessed of the Lord and anointed by the Lord. And he came down to a commandment, which he refused to obey. <clears throat> But he came back when he was confronted by the prophet Samuel. He came to Samuel and he had this, he had this excuse and he had this, you know, this claim, you're right, to success. And he says, but, but we have all of these sheep and oxen for offerings to the Lord. And I don't remember exactly what Samuel said to him, but there's something along these lines. Has the Lord such delight in burnt offerings as he does in obeying the voice of God? He says, to heed is better than to sacrifice, right? And to obey is better than the fat of rams. And when we want to move on, right, to, you know, these, taking these steps towards the Lord's and these free will offerings toward God and, and having this willing heart to offer what's in our, within our control. You know, and we'll say, well, I'll do this for God and I'll do that for God and I'll do this for God. But the trouble is, is that he's not interested in any of those things until he has obedience from you in the other things. And we need to understand. We need to understand what is compulsory. We need to understand what is complementary from us to God. We need to be aware of what God is wanting us to do if we're going to be on task. But he said there that what they were doing now is that they were going to now take the offering. And it says that now it's not demanded from everybody to take the offering. Now the temple tax was demanded. But this wasn't demanded. This was a, supposed to be of anybody who has a willing heart. And we go on, verse 10, he says, All who are gifted artisans among you shall come and make all that the Lord has commanded, the tabernacle, its tent, its covering, its clasps, its boards, its bars, its pillars, its sockets, the ark and its poles with the mercy seat, and the veil of the covering and the table and its poles, all its utensils and all the showbread, also the lampstand for the light, its utensils, its lamps, the oil for the light, the incense altar, its poles, the anointing oils, the sweet incense, the screen for the door, at the entrance of the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with its bronze grating, its poles, all its utensils, and the laver and its base, the hangings of the court, its pillars, their sockets, and the screen for the gate of the court, the pegs of the tabernacle, the pegs of the court, and their cords, the garments of ministry for ministering in the holy place, the garments, the holy garments for Aaron, the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister as priests. And he reminds them of another thing. He reminded them in, in the beginning of the, the way of God, the restrictions of God, the guidelines of God. We know those things. We, we've read those things. Then those things are mandatory in our life. That's the basic, right? That's the foundation. And if you don't have obedience to God in those things, well, it's very difficult to go on from there and do anything else. Well, say, God, I want to bless you with an offering. Well, why don't you bless me by, you know, obeying me first? Well, God, I want to take part in this. I want to take part in that. You know, a good church will not allow ministerial participation from somebody who's in known and outright obvious sin. 
I remember a friend of ours was so offended and so angry because she went to a church and she wanted to sing, you know, a special music song, you know. And they knew very well what her, you know, living condition was with the man that she was with who was not her husband. And, and they lived together. And, and the song leader of that church said, I'm sorry, but you can't sing. She said, why not? And he told her in a very kind way because of the way you're living. Oh, boy, she got offended. She was really upset, and she came to us, right? You know, me, me being a pastor, she came to me, so so she would hopefully have some, you know, word from me, like, oh, how wrong he was. He's not wrong. He's not wrong, and when our church loses standards, right, when we lose what we're about, God doesn't want your special offering if he does not have your basic obedience. Your spouse doesn't want the meal you cooked for him if you're unfaithful. I can assure you that. Right? You don't want a cute little picture that your, your child grew, you know, drew for you if, you know, if they're going off to school and skipping class and beating up other kids and you know, doing all the things that you would desire them not to do. You're like, no, don't pick me a picture. Why don't you behave yourself? Why don't you do what you should do? And then they, you know, they had obedience there. Now they have the opportunity for blessing. Not a blessing for them, but to bless the Lord. To do something for God. And then they went on, and there's another familiarization. Like there's, you have to be familiar with what's compulsory. You have to be familiar with what you could do for the Lord in a complementary sense. And you have to be familiar with another thing, the Lord's agenda. What is the agenda? You know, what are we supposed to be doing and i think it's very reasonable to think about that in our own lives the way we think about that in all of our other worldly pursuits and desires and goals you know the zig ziglers and the jim rones and you know they teach us you know what no we need to have short term goals we need to have long term goals you know we need to have short term activities and actions we need to have long term activities and actions and understanding and we know that those kind of actions and that kind of thinking is tied to a success and and so it is even with god what was their long term goal you shall inherit the land you that's the long that's the most long term goal that they had that they would inherit the land that they would be a light to the gentiles that they would be right that the, the the obstacle of God's manifestation to the world. That was their long-term goal. What's their short-term goal? Hey, build a tabernacle. What are we doing today? We know what our long-term goal is. is right to walk in faithfulness, to finish the course, to live out our life as a light for Christ. You're right, and, and that's what we're supposed to be, his witnesses. But, but listen, beyond that, like, you need to have some kind of a more specific short-term goal. What are we doing? Well, maybe it's like, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so, I'm, I'm trying to lead to Christ. Is that my life's work? No. But is it something I'm working on right now? Yes, it is. Maybe you're raising money, right, for ministry work or something. Maybe you're getting ready to go be a missionary. Maybe you're, you know, working on a short-term goal. Listen, parents, your children are short, short-term goals. Right? You've got like 18 years. See, well, you think about this, you've got about 12 years when they're really little to establish a relationship with them before they hit those teenage years and think that you're an idiot. Right? Not all kids. I'm not accusing all, you know, just, just some kids. Right? And that's all you have, and you think about life in that way. Listen, man, I got like, you know, we got like 12 years to establish this relationship. You know, now when we're looking at 18 years that we got to get this child ready to be a, a grown up. And that, listen, that's not some secular task. That's a task given by God. Go read Deuteronomy chapter 6. You've got to get that child in a, in a very long sense that you want to work in that child's life, their whole life, not to just to get them to be an adult, but to get them to be a servant of the Lord. It may take them into their 20s or their 30s or their 40s. Some of y'all have shared with me that it was well into their years when your children turned to the Lord to serve him, and that's a continued work. But what I'm, you know, do you understand what I'm saying? What is even the task of God in your life? You could say something really simple like, well, to be his witness. Well, yeah, it's a long-term general. That's, that's like everybody, you know. What about you personally? Do you understand? Have, have you spent enough time? Have you, you know, cultivated that relationship to even know on a short-term basis what are the things that you should be working on for the Lord? 
Some people know. I mean, they got it. They know exactly what it is. You know, it's been basted in prayer. They're very familiar with it. They've rolled it over. They've even attempted it before. Now they're t- attempting it again, and they're and they're working on it. They know very well. You know, I boiled down my short-term goal all the way to a day. I wake up in the morning, and I think, you know, I want to finish this day, you know, laying down on my bed saying, okay, Lord, I, I've done well today. I didn't goof it up. I didn't fall into rebellion. I didn't, you know, give in to cynicism. You know, I didn't give in to laziness. I didn't get off track, you know, and I boil it all the way down to that. They had their goal. They had their task right here at hand. It was something that the Lord wanted them to do, build the tabernacle. That's what you're doing. You don't think God works in congregations today to do that very thing, to execute tasks, to put his ministry together to support missions, right, to, to have local outreach, to do all those things, that he uses his body, right, the body of Christ to do these things. But we have to understand, you know, we, we have a sense in a general sense what God's task is for us, but we need to know in a particular sense. This is, this is what you're supposed to be doing. That way when, you know, God comes around and we're doing our group work, and we're, wait, what are you all doing? Well, I, you know, we don't, I don't know. You know, we go to church. You know, if that's a summation of your work in the Lord, well, you're lacking. You know, we actually come to church. Not, it's not the work of the Lord. It's rather to be encouraged, right, to do the work of the Lord. We're just here this morning to encourage each other to go out after this and to go do the real thing and to go, go do the work out there. And they had to know. They had a familiarization with what, what the task was. They knew long-term, it was to enter into the land. They knew short-term for now, hey, this is what we're doing. We're gathering an offering together, anybody who has a willing heart, and we're going to make, right, the articles of the tabernacle. And we go a little further, verse 20. He says, and, and all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses, then everyone came whose heart was stirred, and everyone whose spirit was willing And they brought, taking action, taking action, right? I I suppose that's the hard thing. One hard step is to take action. The next hard step is to stick with it. I don't know about y'all, but I've known in the last 25, 6 years, 25, 6, yeah, something like that however long I've been in Christ. Like, it's over here, right? The memo's hanging in my mind. Hey, you should do this thing. Hey, memorize scripture. Hey, you know, go back and talk to that person, witness to him. Hey, pray. And I have all these things tacked up that I know to do. But at some point in time, you actually, you have to decisively take action. And the, you know, the, and the troubling thing is, is God's not going to come, you know, down out of heaven and hold you at gunpoint and say, you better do this right now. Who wants a child like that anyway? Wouldn't that be rewarding if you had to threaten your child with violence or something every time you wanted them to do something? You know, no, that's, that's not rewarding. But action has to be taken. You know, like, well, you know, well, that's really silly. Well, it's not really silly because it's so difficult for us to do it. And to take that action and to carve out that time and to do that thing first. And whatever it is, some task of the Lord, I, probably all of us could think of something. You know, what do you think the Lord would like you to do? And, you, you know, well, I can think of a few things. <laughs> you know, there's, there's the things in our lives that we can think that he would like us not to do. Repentance is taking action as well. Forsaking something, that's taking action. And at some point in time, and I know what it is to have something in your life, and you know, you're like, man, I really need to put that away. Well, I don't know about that. You're like, I don't know about that. Or I tried and I failed. I don't know if there's any point in trying again. But we have to take action. And we have to move, and they did, and they brought. And they jumped into action, and they got on task. And we read through this and pay attention. You know, every time it says their heart was stirred and, you know, or the spirit 
and whose spirit was willing. And we look here, verse 21, he says, um, Then everyone came whose heart was stirred, and everyone whose spirit was willing, and they brought the Lord's offering of the work of the tabernacle of meeting for all its service and for the holy garments. They came both men and women, as many as had a willing heart, and brought earrings and nose rings and rings and necklaces, all the jewelry of the gold, um, that is, every man who made an offering of gold to the Lord, and every man with whom was found blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, goat's hair, red, uh, red skins of rams, and badger skins, brought them. Every one who offered an offering of silver or bronze brought the Lord's offering, and every one with whom was found acacia wood for any work of the service would brought it. All the women who were gifted artisans spun yarn with their hands and brought what they had spun of blue, purple, and scarlet, and fine linen. And all, and all the women whose heart stirred with wisdom spun yarns of goat's hair. The rulers brought onyx stones and the stones to be set in the ephod and the breastplate and spices and oil for the light for the oil, anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, the children of Israel brought a free will offering to the Lord. All the men and women whose hearts were willing to bring material for all kinds of work which the Lord, by the hand of Moses, had commanded to be done. I think it's obvious that it's by the grace of God that we can ever or ever do anything for the Lord. That's obvious, right? The grace of God, right, leads to repentance. The goodness of God leads to repentance, what is said, right? And the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. That we love him because he first loved us. We know all these things, and yet God still ascribes a measure of ownership to our own ministry. Now, when the scripture says ministry, don't think, you know, of, you know, this liturgical robes and, you know, like ministry or even like ministry. You know, the word ministry in scripture means service. And when it says that Joshua ministered unto Moses, it, it served him. That's all it is. And it's very obvious through scripture, even in a negative sense, when there's criticism, what is he criticizing them for? The lack of their ministry or their polluted ministry? There's obviously ownership in that. If there wasn't ownership, there wouldn't be a judgment. But there's also ownership in a positive sense. And the tough thing about ownership, which if things are going well, we like ownership. If things are going poor, we like anonymity, right? You know, those group projects, when the grade was really bad, we go home and you tell your parents, well, you know, man, I got a 50 on my group project. But that group, you know, it was, you know, it was, uh, it was the group. You, know, you threw the group under the bus and you don't take ownership of it. But the interesting thing about God and how he works with us individually is we have to take ownership. And I read through there and so many times he said over and over, even in this whole chapter, he says it's their heart was willing, or as their heart stirred them. You know what a true indicator of the worth of your ministry and heart is? The action that you truly take towards the Lord. I mean, that's, that's truly it, even in the sense of obedience. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not obey with the things which I command? You know, who is he that loveth me? He who hath my commandments and keepeth them. If you love me, keep my commandments. And he, and he gives this example over and over and over again. And he's saying, well, where, where's the ownership in there? He says, well, you know, the outcome of your actions and your actions, you know, they, they, they will tell on you just like the words that come out of your mouth will tell you what's in your heart. Ever hear anybody say something you know, like, you know, blankety blank? Oh, I don't know where that came from. I do. <laughs> The Lord does. He said, out of the abundance of that heart, the mouth speaks. And you want to take, we have to take ownership. Like, what am I? 
what am I and what do I actually do? And you look at your own life and, you know, but, you know, we say, I love the Lord, but I don't spend time with him in prayer. Hmm. That, that tells us differently. I love the Lord, but I don't really pay much attention to his word. I don't know. I love the Lord, but I don't honor him for my wealth. Y'all see what, you know, the way God puts it in Scripture is that, you know, the outcome of your actions is what shows in, you know, in your heart. That's the way Jesus put it. And, and we have to take ownership of that. And I am what I am. And if you're, you know, horribly disappointed in yourself, well, be encouraged by this, that God knew all of this from the get-go, and he still called you anyway. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that grace? You're like, well, God, I'm not, I'm not really impressed with my actions. I'm not really impressed with, you know, the measures of sacrifice and effort I take towards you. You know, and it's a little bit telling, and we know. We know what sort of a man we are, like James says, you know, that we behold ourselves as in a mirror, and we see what sort of a person we are, but we don't want to go away and, and to forget those things. But listen, you know, staying on task and being a good task person, you know, what do you have to do? You have to know what he's commanded you to do. You have to know what he's commanded you not to do. You know what? You have to know what basic obedience to the Lord is. Then you have to know what elective obedience to the Lord is. You know, do, do you, does he put some kind of measure on your life that you have to pray for four hours a day? No, we live by grace. That means that you have the liberty to give to the Lord all that your heart desires. And whatever you give to him, that's what your heart desires. That's the tough part. And then we get to see what, what sort of a person that we are. But the point is not to run us down, but Lord, to, to cause us to change. And to cause us to take action and cause us to. And so often, you know, the thing that limits us is the, is the faith that we have. I would spend, you know, 30 minutes in prayer, but I'm not sure that it's going to change anything. Hmm. That's why we don't do it. Now, I would spend time in his word. You know, one brother told me this week, he's read through the Bible nearly 45 times. And I said, what is, is that like eight chapters a day is what I was guessing? You know, I, I roughly four chapters a day will get you through the Bible in a year. You know, and he says, I don't know. I just read, you know, for an hour at a time. I thought, boy, what a devotional. What a devotional, right? What a great thing. What, you know, what an what a awesome gift. Does God make him do that? No. Is it a wonderful gift to God? Is it a blessing to God? I believe it is. He says, look at this son who wants to read my word, who wants to spend time with me. He was looking for those who are of a free will, uh, a willing heart. And here we have this term, in Scripture, the children of Israel brought a free will offering. God is pleased with your obedience, right? Not to have other gods before him and not to make into yourself a graven image and not to take his name in vain and to remember, you know, the, the Sabbath rest that is in Christ and salvation is by grace through faith. I put it in the context of the New Testament for us. He's pleased when we honor our mother and father. He's pleased when we don't commit adultery, steal, or lie. You know, he's when we, you know, he's pleased when we don't covet. But those aren't the very best things that we could do for the Lord. Those are basics, right? That's like your child, you know, keeping their room put together. It's like them not getting in trouble at school. They're doing their homework. They're doing all the basics, you know. Is any of that stuff for you, really? No, that's for your child. All of the basic obedience that God has commanded us when he said, thou shalt, he says, help yourself. When he says, thou shalt not, he says, don't hurt yourself. All of those things, they're not really for God. They're for us. They're for our good. And he's saying, you know, this is, this is for you, but, but there are things that we can do in life that are really for God. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. How can I bless him? 
when you have measures of faith that are beyond basic, like the centurion, you know, God was willing and he was okay with, you know, going to his house and, and showing up there. But when the centurion pulled out a measure of faith above and beyond and said, no, you don't even have to go. He said, wow. <laughs> right? You know, he said, wow, that's great. You know, if God demanded us, you know, uh, from us a, a legal tenth, right? And we were to pay that tenth, and that was a very basic thing, and he didn't demand another 5%. But, you know, but if we went on and gave another 5%, now that's a blessing. When you didn't require your children, right, to, to take an extra measure, I remember, I can remember the first times I really feel like I pleased my parents in life. One, a very young age, I think I was probably six or seven years old, and uh, we lived in a little ranch house, you know, on, on that same ranch, and, and I don't know why it occurred to me, but I don't know what my mom was off doing, but I looked around the kitchen, and I had watched her clean the kitchen enough times, and I thought, you know, I can do this. You know, and so I, in her absence, I, I cleaned up the kitchen, and I remember even like scrubbing the stainless steel sink and wiping it all down. Not a drop of water was left on it, you know. And, and, and she came in, and she was just like, what is this? I didn't demand this of you. I didn't threaten you. I didn't have to put this into your heart. I didn't have to put this into your mind. And I, of my own free will and an initiative, I did something right for my mom. And can you believe, I mean, that's been 40 years ago. And I still remember her action, her reaction. I can remember, I, you know, growing up working with my dad, you know, don't think of him in a bad way, but I don't think I ever did anything right until I was probably like in my early 20s. You know, and that's not because, you know, my dad was a, a overbearing jerk. He was just a very meticulous, skilled man. And every time I would do something, he would see the error in it and said, nope, nope, like this, you know. And he would, you know, and he would show me. And I'm very grateful that he did that. But I remember the very first times after I moved out of the house, after I was doing work on my own, you know, and, and I had all those things going on and my dad would come. And I remember the first few times he came to help me on my job site. And he showed up. I remember one time he showed up, had the, the saw there. He said, well, he said, just tell me what to do. I'm your cut man. I don't know if that means anything to y'all. But I knew in that moment that my dad was pleased. And he approved. And he had looked at, you know, and he had looked at my life and what I was doing and that it had gone beyond the basics which he had required of me. And that is when we really are able to bless somebody when we go beyond the basics, when we go beyond what's required of us. And when we do something like this, a free will offering, listen, don't stop at what God demands of you. Don't stop there. That's, that's just the very basic, right? That's the minimum. He's not like just blown away with those things, but rather go and do something of your own free will, right? Of your own sacrifice, a free will offering. He didn't demand that of you, but you went and gave, and that's so much the way we operate in our new covenant with the Lord. He's not going to, has he, has he assigned any of us in scripture a time, amount of time that we're supposed to spend with him in the word? No. According to your heart. That's how much time you spend with him in the word. Has he demanded us a, an amount of time that we spend with him in prayer? No, it's according to your heart. Has he demanded you a percentage to honor him from his will? No, it's according to your heart. And that's the covenant that we live in. That's what it means when we, when we don't live under the law. Now, we know very well that he has moral guidelines that he expects us to, to fall in. But when it comes to blessing him, it's according to his heart. But that's a telling thing when you realize how much you do or don't bless him. The condition of our heart. And the good thing is, is that we can recognize that and say, Lord, change my heart and give me a different heart and cause me to, to desire the things that you desire. And, and there's a whole lot more to be said about that and how to get from the state that we're in into a, to a better condition. And a lot of that is removing things in our lives that, that just aren't best and don't belong. Carving out the time. Dropping social media. Dropping moving time, TV time. Dropping hobby time. Dropping fishing time, drop, you know, whatever we have to sacrifice, maybe you know, financially. 
You know, maybe you don't get to buy all your meals pre-prepared or something like that to be super easy. And, you know, if you want to honor the Lord from your wealth, I remember one lady, you know, telling me that, that, you know, she couldn't honor the Lord from her wealth because she really felt like she needed a million dollars in her 401k before she did that. <laughs> okay. According to your heart, right? So let it be. Don't you see the potential there? I guess that's the thing that gets me. I remember as a young Christian reading the scriptures, bless the Lord on my soul, and thinking, how? How can I, how can I bless God? And I don't think I really understood until I had kids and they got older and I realized how they could bless me. And I said, oh, I now I see. Now I see how I can bless the Lord. But they made a free will offering. The very best things you can ever do for God will be voluntary, not compulsory. It says, And Moses said to the children of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, and the son of Hur, and the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God and wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze and cutting of jewels for the setting and carving wood, and to work in all manner of artistic workmanship, and he has put in his heart the ability to teach. That's really marvelous to me, and I don't think I quite understand why God has done the things the way that he has done. Why it is, like the scripture says in, in Romans chapter 1, that, that the righteousness of Christ is revealed from believer to believer, from faith to faith. And if God wanted to, he could have, just like he did Abraham, reveal himself directly to everybody that ever turns to him. But for some reason, he wants to use his church. And I think that reason is for the opportunity of love and the opportunity of service. And you stop and think, well, I want to be loving, and I want to be loving like God. Well, you know, what God has dedicated himself more to than anything else in existence in the history of man in a loving way is the salvation of man. I wonder why, I wonder why God, you know, set it up the way he did that we should be his witnesses. Don't you realize there's an opportunity there to love your fellow man? There's an opportunity there, right? To, I, I always think it's interesting, you know, like, Little kids want to feed beans as snack, right? Sorry, I said the word. Hey, why do they want to do that? It's that opportunity, that intimacy, that exchange, that inclusion. God is including you into something. And it's even, it doesn't even stop at evangelism as we go on and as we grow in Christ. Why is it, you know, that God has chosen to use conduits of teaching? You know, that we have that opportunity, right, to bless and to be blessed and to share and to receive. And we have that fellowship in him. But that's the way it is, that he's blessed some to teach. And truly, all, everybody, you know, learns from somebody else's teaching. Even Elisha, right, had Elijah. You know, Joshua had Moses. I, I, I'm convinced, convinced that John the Baptist had somebody there was somebody, I think very likely a man named Zacharias, right? <laughs> that was obviously a believer, right? There was somebody in his life to teach. And it's interesting that here in this work, that he said, here he called this man, right? Uh, I forgot his name. It's, uh, 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 uh. Well, it's right there somewhere. Aholiab, right? But he'd put into his heart, Bezalel, there he is, right? And he put into his heart the ability to teach. Now you say, well, you know, God could have, you know, just given them all that, right? But that's not the way he wanted to do it. And I think perhaps in that is, you know, a measure of humility that God wants his people to practice. I don't know, but that's the way he did it. But the most important thing from that is realizing that you, God very much intends for you to learn from other people. And to listen to other people and other people in Christ and to learn in that sense. And here's the other guy. And in him and in Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach uh, of the tribe of Dan, he has filled him with the skill to do all manner of work and engraver and the designer and the tapestry maker in blue, purple, and scarlet thread and, and fine linen and of the weaver, 
those who do every work, and those who design artistic works. And now they get about, they stay about the work. And the next four chapters, 36, 37, 38, 39, are an explanation, uh, a carrying out of all the instructions that were given to Moses. And, and I'm not going to read them for you. Relax. It's rough. It's, it's four chapters uh, reciting what's already been in Scripture, and it's really straightforward. I did read through it, but it's the building. Uh, and, and by the way, the people give more than enough. More than enough, and what a blessing that is, right? To all involved, they gave more than enough. I, can't, I don't even have to imagine how Moses felt about that. I can tell you Moses was thrilled, and I bet you the Lord was thrilled. And they were doing so well. They gave more than enough, and they had to say, stop giving. And then they built the tabernacle, and they, in 37, they, um, there was the making of the Ark of the Testimony, the making of the showbread, right? The making of the lampstand, the making of the altar and incense, the anointing oil and the incense. And uh, 38 goes on, um, the altar of burnt offering, the bronze labor, right? The court of the tabernacle. There was uh, materials for the tabernacle. And chapter 39, uh, the garments of the priesthood, uh, according to the commandment. It's, I don't remember how many times in Exodus it's written this way, but according to the commandment, as he commanded them, that word commanded. I know it's seven times in chapter 39 and seven times in chapter 40, that according to the commandment given Moses. According to the commandment given Moses. Attentiveness to what he was commanding them to do. And then chapter 40, they erected the tabernacle, and I'd like to finish at the very end of chapter 40. After they had built it, assembled it, done all those things, chapter 40, verse 34, it says, then the, then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it, and the glory of the Lord filled it, uh, filled the tabernacle. Now, I assume that that was the kind of presence that passed by him when God had to put him into the little cleft of a rock. We know that to some extent Moses got to be in the presence of God because it, it made his face to shine. And they talked about his, his tent of meeting that was outside the camp and that he would go there and, and when he went there, well, the cloud would follow him over there. But in here there was obviously some kind of different presence, more intense, uh, I think, in the sense that he couldn't go in there. And verse 36 and said, whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. It says, for the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle day by day, and the fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. And this is the only good way to live your Christian life. There needs to be enough reverence and obedience to the Lord to have his fellowship in your life. Here for a season, they responded and they obeyed and they were faithful and they, they were on task and they did what God had required them to do. And guess what? It resulted in the presence of God in their life. They're really doing it. And that's, that's what, you know, if you want the presence of God in your life, that's what you have to do. You have to really do it. You have to really do it. The things that God just said don't do that, you have to not do. I know that's rocket science, but that, if, it, if it was so easy, why don't we do it? <laughs> you know? And the things that he's cam commanded us to do, well, that we need to do. And then, then, like he said in Isaiah chapter 1, he says, go, you know, cleanse yourselves and wash yourselves. He said, you know, Stop doing what is evil and learn to do good. And when you're doing that, well, then I'll have fellowship with you. Then you'll have my presence in your life. And, you know, that's the only way to live your life in the Lord is with that presence because that's a guiding presence. You don't have to go around in such anxiety and fear and, well, should I do this? And is that the will of God for me? And is that what you do? What you do is you cultivate such a relationship and a fellowship with the Lord that you know when, you know, and you end up following his presence. And a good thing 
to ask yourself throughout life and in the things you do, is the Lord with you in this? Is the Lord with me in this? You know, good luck in some financial scam, and you can say, is the Lord with me? And then, no, 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 he's not. Good luck being in the gall of bitterness and saying, is the Lord with me in this? No. Good luck getting caught up in laziness. You know, and said, is the Lord with me in this? No, he's not. You see how simple it is. You know, is the Lord with me? Can I, can I do this with the Lord? You know, and is his presence with me? Is his power with me in this very thing? No, it's not. Or yes, it is. And if it's a place that God would go, and if it's a thing that God would do, well, then we can do it. Don't you, you realize that they navigated their life by the presence of the Lord? And if I do this, will the Lord depart his presence from me? And, you know, if I do this, will that encourage his presence in my life? And that's how they governed their navigation. That's how they went about their life, you know, in the, when the Lord was with them. Well, that's where they remained. And when the Lord was moving in a particular direction, well, that's where they went. And that's what we need to be able to do is to perceive, right, where God is with us in life and the things that God is with us in in life. And those things do. I think it's probably easier for us to perceive where he's when he's not with us, right? But listen, if you stay out of where you shouldn't be, you can't help but be where you should be. The scripture says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And you don't have to worry if that's true. Well, God, am I, where am I supposed to be? Well, are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? If you can say yes, boy, you can rest. You say, yeah. And when I need to know something, he's going to let me know. Right. And until then, I'm going to do what he's commanded me to do. You're going to be on task. Doing those things. I would want to encourage you, you know, I think we know the long-term task that God wants us to do, to finish our course, to live out our life in faith, to be his witnesses. But what if you had to say for the next month or for the next six months? Or even if you're like me, an extra hard knucklehead, you have to boil it down to a day. What does the Lord want me to do today? <laughs> And you write yourself a list, right? <laughs> and then you're just looking to get getting to that night when you put your head on the pillow and say, okay, Lord, I did it. I did today, and tomorrow is going to be tomorrow. One day at a time, it's, that's the way I do it. Let's pray. Father, <clears throat> God calls us to be on task for you, and even to understand what the will of God is, Lord, Lord, to know what we're supposed to be doing today and tomorrow, and Lord, what we're, what we're supposed to do with our life collectively. God, that we might be successful in you. That we might be productive, Lord. That we might be that, <clears throat> as you described even our Lord, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Father, I know we have your favor by grace, but God, we want to have your blessing. And we want to learn those things which are pleasing unto you. And we do not want to goof off our days, Lord, with addictive pleasures, mindless entertainment, But Father, let us be about your business, about your harvest, God, because you described this age as an age in which the laborers were few. So God, I pray that you'd turn us on and turn us up, Lord, and open our eyes and bless us to see and bless us to hear. And God, as your scripture says, to awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. Lord, we want to be those competent servants whom you find doing, Lord, what you've tasked us to do when you return. God, I believe it's near and it's soon. 
And God, wake us up to that reality that someday, Lord, that you're going to come and you're going to return. And you're going to evaluate what we've done with the blood of Christ in our life. And what we've done with the opportunity of ministry and service that we've done in our life, God. And Lord, snap us out of it. And be gracious to us, Lord, to give us a sober mind, God. And to see, Lord, the potential that is right before us, God. To fear you, to obey you, to serve you, to bless you daily. In Christ's name, amen.